contaminated aircraft sounds like it should be put into quarantine for a couple of weeks and left to cool off. This isn't the case though, and it has nothing to do with anything infectious. But what is a contaminated aircraft? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 23 in the Principles of Flight series. This will be the final class in the Principles of Flight series before we move on to a different subject. But before we do that though, we better take a look at some aircraft contamination. Aircraft are designed to be flown within a defined flight envelope, which means within a set range of altitude, speeds, load factors, masses, etc. And if we fly outside of this flight envelope, we can cause damage to the aircraft and we might not be able to achieve the desired aircraft performance. This envelope that we fly within assumes the aircraft is free from contamination, or at least within a tolerable level. Contamination is essentially anything that disturbs the airflow around the flight surfaces by modifying the shape and or texture of the aircraft's skin. This damage can be caused by things known as foreign object debris, which can be anything ranging from like, um, like nuts and bolts or bits of metal or something like a bird strike would technically be foreign object debris. And that would cause damage to the aircraft structure. And that would modify the way that the air flows and the texture of the skin. Including this as well would be things like oil and dirt and the other side of contamination is bad weather. And this is the one that we see most often. The main contamination in the form of weather comes from ice. Now ice might seem like just ice, but there are broadly speaking, three types in aviation. First, we have frost. Frost is a thin layer of crystallized water that forms usually from just the water vapor that's in the air. And when the temperature reaches below zero for the water vapor to freeze, it freezes onto the surface of the aircraft. It's usually only a few millimeters thick and it's the kind of ice that you would get on your car windshield after a cold, clear night. The second type of ice is something known as rime ice and it is formed on the leading edge of the flight surfaces and it occurs when super cooled water droplets finally have something to attach to and quickly freeze into ice crystals. Rime ice is pretty brittle because the freezing process happens really quickly, which means there are loads of uh, air pockets trapped within the structure and that creates weak points. The third type is clear ice. And this is formed by supercooled water droplets once again, but it's when they don't freeze instantly on impact and they actually flow rearwards over the surface and freeze at a slower rate. This creates a more uniform structure within the crystals of the actual ice particles, and that leads to a clear ice which covers a large area and it's quite strong and hard. So rime ice and clear ice form when we're within icing conditions, which usually means in moisture between about minus 20 degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius. And I know 10 degrees Celsius is above the freezing point, but the wind chill effect cools down the temperature of the aircraft surfaces down significantly. And therefore you can run into the risk of freezing temperatures, even when actually well above freezing. So both rime ice and clear ice change the shape and texture of the wing, causing friction in the boundary layer and leading to an early separation of the airflow, as we can see here. Frost does this as well, but to a lesser extent. The obvious problems can be seen right here. So we have a lower value for our CL max, and we have an earlier uh, lower stalling angle of attack. The weight of the ice as well must be taken into account, and it means we're heavier and therefore need more lift. So we must travel faster to achieve the same amount of lift with this reduced value for CL max, which means our stall speed increases. Hopefully you can start to see why contamination is undesired. Another point to note about these smaller stalling angles is that the stall warning devices that we use to warn us of impending stalls are calibrated for non-contaminated stalls. 
So the reducing angle, stalling angle of attack that comes with contamination may go unwarned by the angle of attack sensors or any other stalling uh, warning devices. So we could stall the aircraft without having any audio or visual warnings. And because of this increase in stall speed that we need because of the heavier weight, that means that we could stall at a point in flight where normally we wouldn't, such as on the approach when we're flying slow, for instance. When we have contamination, we also have an increase in the skin friction drag and to some extent the form drag. This leads to a reduction in excess thrust available. And if you remember from our flight physics class, the excess thrust is what we'd use for our uh, climbing performance. So if you're using more thrust to overcome the more drag, that means you have less excess thrust and you have a reduced amount of climb performance. So icing on the tail of an aircraft is an especially bad problem. The tailplane is usually a bit sharper and therefore starts to ice a bit quicker. This is because the supercooled water droplets are displaced uh, a lot less, so they are more likely to hit the leading edge. So if the ice builds up on the leading edge so bad, it can cause the tailplane to stall. And therefore, instead of producing downforce, it doesn't produce any downforce at all. And that leads to the lift weight couple producing a nose down pitching moment. And if you've got a stalled tailplane, that means you can't correct the problem. De-icing is the process of removing the ice from a surface. This can be achieved through physically removing the ice by hand, by using de-icing fluids, or by using an inbuilt de-ice system on the aircraft, such as inflatable boots. These are devices on the leading edge that have air or some other gas pumped into them once ice is formed in order to break it. So this area here would expand out the way and it would break off that ice as it goes. Anti-ice devices protect against ice forming. The most effective anti-ice measure is to not encounter icing conditions at all, which is a lot easier said than done. There are also anti-icing fluids and inbuilt anti-icing systems. Anti-icing systems normally consist of heating up this leading edge to stop ice forming. On the 737, for example, we take hot air from part of the engine and it's diverted through pipes along the leading edge to stop that ice forming. This means essentially that the surface is too warm for any ice to form. These heating devices would also have a bit of a de-ice effect as well because they will melt any ice that's already formed on the leading edge, but they are primarily a anti-ice measure. When using de-icing and anti-icing fluids, it's important to know about holdover times. So the holdover time is essentially how effective the anti-icing fluid will be, or the de-icing fluid will be, at keeping the ice off. Because there's no point in getting de-iced and then having to, it only lasts half an hour and then you take off in an hour's time because then you're going to be fully iced by the time you take off. Not very useful. So you see that there's a table here and it depends on the temperature outside and the sort of weather conditions that you're in. This is just for a specific type. This is type 2 fluid, which is very common. Um, and you can see that if you have a lot colder temperature, the hold over time is going to be a lot lower. So for instance, if we just look at uh, very light snow, snow grains or pellets, which is this green column, green column means it's going to be quite good. But if you look at minus three degrees and above, you're looking at, depending on the concentration here in the left, so this is, you know, 100% of the fluid, this is a 75, 25% dilution between water, 50, 50, etc. So if you look at 100%, or actually, yeah, no, let's look at 100. So at minus three degrees, 100% concentration, you're looking at a holdover time between two hours 35 and three hours, so pretty good. But then as it gets colder, go all the way down to the bottom, we're looking at minus 25 to minus 29, with 100% concentration, you're only down to 20 to 30 minutes. 
So it's important to note these holdover times. And if your holdover time has expired by the time it's ready, if by the time you are ready to take off, you've got to return to wherever you were getting de-iced or anti-iced because you will have contamination potentially.